If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. On Trinity Sunday, which always falls on the Sunday following Pentecost, Christians celebrate our unique understanding and central teaching about God as Trinity, three in one and one in three. In his highly regarded book, Principles of Christian Theology, the late Anglican theologian John Macquarie suggests that this Trinitarian language will, quote, probably strike us nowadays as quaint, and that we may be completely puzzled to know what is meant by the idea of a God who is one in three and three in one, one substance and three persons. Macquarie adds, it must be expected that any language that tries to talk to us of the mystery of God will have some obscurities. The language and understanding of God as Trinity is one in three and three in one is not in the Bible, though it is strongly inferred in the New Testament. Trinitarian language and understanding were developed in the early years of the Christian experience through debates and councils. Sometimes it was not pretty, but eventually there was general agreement which resulted in creedal formulas. Still, these ancient understandings aren't always understandable to contemporary people. So how do we make sense of God today, and particularly of the Trinity, which is, after all, our distinctive Christian understanding of God? How do we arrive at new understandings that are still in keeping with this? Today, many theologians build on the ancient or classical ideas of the Trinity, but focus on the idea of relationship, that is, how the three persons of the Trinity relate within their own oneness, but also how the Trinity relates to the rest of creation, including humankind. Years ago, a favorite theologian of mine, Roman Catholic priest and theologian David Tracy, was quoted saying, Real religion does not give final answers. It makes us ask better questions. I like that. I like it a lot. I often find that when people are asking questions about God, they're on the growing edge of faith. Questioning opens us up to new discoveries about God. Actually, I think that's what was going on with Nicodemus, who was featured in our Gospel reading for this Trinity Sunday. The reading was probably chosen by the Church because it includes references to all three persons of the Trinity. Nicodemus was learned, a Pharisee, a teacher himself, and not only a teacher, but one of the ruling class, as John describes him. Nicodemus came to Jesus by night, perhaps in stealth. Perhaps he didn't want it known that he was speaking with Jesus. But the darkness of this nighttime meeting is not merely the literal dark, it is also spiritual darkness. Nicodemus sensed something in Jesus, something powerful of God. He wanted to know more. He had questions, lots of questions. Questions, I think, that were on the growing edge of faith. Nicus came to Jesus by night, a time when rabbis typically conversed. He's respectful. Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. You can tell this exchange is of a different sort than we've seen in other accounts of Jesus with Pharisees. Nicodemus is not here to test or challenge Jesus. He seems to have a deep hunger for God and a yearning to know what this person he has heard so much about has to offer. And again, he begins by showing Jesus genuine respect, respect which acknowledges that Jesus works, his signs, his miracles, are evidence of Jesus' genuine connection with God. Jesus answered him, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. As is so often the case in John's Gospel, Jesus' response to his inquirer is oblique, enigmatic. Also typical of John's Gospel, the one who is in conversation with Jesus is often operating at a lower plane in the conversation. Jesus begins with lofty words of the kingdom of heaven. Nicodemus can't launch himself beyond earth. Jesus speaks in heavenly, figurative terms. Nicodemus hears only a literal earthly terms, questioning, well, how can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? And maybe he's pushing Jesus to clarify. Following John's pattern, a question leads to deeper waters. Jesus shrugs off the literal interpretation made explicit in Nicodemus' question and draws him further in. Jesus answers, very truly, I tell you. 
No one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. It's clearly a reference to the waters of baptism and the integral relationship of these waters with the gift of the Holy Spirit. But Nicodemus knows little about baptism. Imagine how confused he must have been. Jesus doesn't give him a lot of space to think, but continues on. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. Jesus is speaking of the mystery of God. There is something inherently ineffable about God. Needless to say, this is a whole new way of looking at things. Jesus stirs things up for Nicodemus, stirs it up with all this talk of water and the Holy Spirit, strange, elusive things that are always changing, always on the move. You can never step into the same wind or the same river twice. That's a discomforting reality for people who like things fixed and certain. Jesus turns Nicodemus' world upside down. You can hear Nicodemus' exasperation and his fear. How can these things be? Jesus brings Nicodemus up a little short. Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? You can imagine Nicodemus shrugging his shoulders, not having a clue. Jesus goes on. But what he has to say is, again, enigmatic, puzzling. Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. It's a foreshadowing of the crucifixion, but of course Nicodemus has no idea. But with these last sentences, Nicodemus undoubtedly thought to himself, what are you talking about? What does this talk of ascending to heaven and descending mean? Perhaps he thought of Jacob of old, who had a strange dream of a stairway or a ladder to heaven where angels ascended and descended. The stairway and ladder marked the intersecting place of earth and heaven. Was Jesus suggesting that he himself was now that place of intersection? And again, that reference to Moses lifting up the serpent or the Son of Man being lifted up. Who is this Son of Man? Nicodemus must have wondered, and how will he be lifted up? But then come those verses which have become among the most important verses in all of Christian teaching. Verses held up on poster boards in hundreds of football stadiums around the country. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. And there it is, Jesus' primary point, his primary teaching. The mysterious and elusive movement of God does have purpose, fixed purpose. Its purpose is love, love for the world, love, relationship with you and me, I wonder what Nicodemus made of that. I wonder how he viewed that stunning statement of Jesus about God's love for the world as an answer to his question. Well, we don't know. Nicodemus doesn't speak again, and he just disappears from the scene. He does appear later to defend Jesus when the other religious authorities put Jesus on trial. And Nicodemus also reappears in John's Gospel with Joseph of Arimathea to bury Jesus after he was crucified. I wonder if he replayed the tape of his earlier conversation with Jesus, thought through all his questions, pondered anew the words, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Did Nicodemus grow in his faith and in his understanding of this mysterious God of elusive wind and water, this God of love, because he had a conversation with Jesus? We can talk all we want about the nature and essence of God, but in the end, it's what it comes down to. God is love. That is the nature and essence of God. Moreover, God loves, for God so loved the world that he gave his only Son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the the Son into the world to condemn the world, 
but in order that the world might be saved through him an act of love. If we don't get anything else right on this Trinity Sunday, let's get this right. If we do, everything else will flow from it. God's love will flow from it. And that would be a tremendous way to understand and celebrate the Trinity.